Good morning. Welcome. Um, I had to tell first service who hit Jen with the water balloon after she was all dressed up, looking nice from a wedding. It was my sweet, innocent wife, Maddie, who came home bragging about how good her arm is and that she pelted Jen. Jen didn't even know. She crossed the yard. And uh, so I promised Maddie I wouldn't tell her and I told her first service, so. But also, you guys get a special treat, too, because Maddie was also bragging about someone else she pelted with a water balloon, which was our youth director, Christina. And you guys wonder why I don't show up to these things. (laughs) I know what's waiting for me. I married her for that arm. As Jen said, we are continuing our greatest story series, and we're starting season three. So, I encourage you to go back and watch season one and two, because just like your favorite TV show, if you jumped in during season three, you're not going to know what's going on. Bible works the same way. But here we are starting season three. Now, season one and two take up the first 11 chapters of the Bible. We've covered those in the past few weeks. Genesis 1 through 11 take us through seasons one and two. The next 918 chapters of the Old Testament make up season three. So if you think my sermons have been long already, just get, you better buckle up. So we've got 918 chapters to cover in season three. Now, if you remember, season one was creation, where we saw that God ordered this world as a home in a way that mankind and God can live together. In season two, the fall, that all goes wrong. Last week we looked at the Tower of Babel, and what we should have felt is a little down, because this story is not going very good, right? God has dispersed all of mankind. He said, fine, you want to do things your way? Have it your way. I'm going to give you over, I'm going to divorce the nations. And so we're not feeling real great about this story. But when season three begins, we see God's solution to the problem. And that solution is Israel. It's the storyline of the nation of Israel. Now, if I was God, I'm being sarcastic for a moment. For those of you who don't follow sarcasm very well, This is one of those sarcastic times. If I was God, my solution would have been very democratic, right? Would have been very equal. I think every person should have just gotten a pair of AirPods dropped out of heaven. And you just put them in, and God speaks to you in English. And he just tells you who he is, and he tells you what he's doing in the world. That's how America would do it. Right? That's what you should that should have been the solution. You want to reveal yourself to the world? Give us all some headphones and just talk to us. Tell us what's going on. That's not what God did. God instead looks at this cosmic story of creation and how mankind, all of humanity, is rebelling and turning from him. And he looks at this mess and he zeroes in on one guy. One person, living thousands of years ago in the ancient Near East. This is not very close to my plan, if you can tell. And this guy can't have any kids. His name's Abraham. And God says, hey, Abraham, through you, I'm going to make a great family. You're going to have kids. That family is going to grow into a nation. And through that, all of the nations are going to be blessed. It's not going to be written down in English. It's not going to be in America. This is going to be through this one guy, Abraham. I'm going to reveal myself to the world through his family. That's my solution, God says. And so God calls Abraham. He fulfills his promise. Abraham has children. And we, most of us know the story that through a series of events, Israel gets enslaved in Egypt 
And God remembers Israel, and he rescues and saves them out of Egypt. You guys know this story? You've seen the movie? You've seen Prince of Egypt? Or the Ten Commandments? Whatever generation you're in? I'm a Prince of Egypt man. Cartoons for me. Some of you enjoy the old, was it Charleston Heston? Yeah, I got it. I've seen it. But you know how this story goes. God rescues Israel out of Egypt. They cross the Red Sea. And we get to this point where they're before Mount Sinai and they're given the law in Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. I fondly call this portion of Scripture the Bible reading plan graveyard. Come on, some of you started that this year. You said, I'm going to read my Bible. And you're just rolling along through the first 69 chapters. You're like, this is going well. There's some weird stuff in here, but I'm getting through it. I'm tracking what's going on. But then you hit Exodus 20, and it just starts to be this list of laws. That go on and on. There's sixteen. There's 613 of them is the traditional number. Depends on how you count them, but we'll stick with that for today. And your Bible plan dies. Come on, somebody in here has done that. If you haven't done it, you should try it. You'll see what happens. You'll hit the roadblock. There's all these laws that are given. Some of them make sense, kind of. A lot of them are really weird. We don't know what's going on. In my opinion, this isn't really an opinion. This is probably more than an opinion. (laughs) But in my opinion, the law gets a pretty bad rap in church. In English, law by itself kind of has a negative connotation. It's a prohibition against something, right? And it's a negative thing. Well, the Hebrew word for law is Torah. Can you say Torah so I know you got it? Torah. Torah Torah does not have a negative connotation. In fact, it would be more literally translated, more faithfully translated as instruction or teaching. Now, that should take a little bit of the weight off of it already, right? Because we can all say, hey, you know, I think... Probably a good idea to follow the instruction in the teaching of God. That might be a helpful thing, right? Well, that's what Torah is. It's instruction and teaching. The other reason, besides just the English word law having a negative connotation, the other reason the law gets kind of a bad rap is because of church history. Can I teach you just a second, just for a second, about some church history? Okay. So, at one point... The Catholic Church, which was the only church at the time, they got this really good idea. They thought, you know what would be good a good idea is if we charged people money to get into heaven. And you can, we can even charge people money to get their family members into heaven. Now, if you've been here for a little bit, you know that I think if they would have just kept their eyes on the fact that you're bringing heaven to earth instead of trying to escape earth and get to heaven, that would have solved the problem anyway, right? But regardless of all of that, that they got their eyes on the wrong thing, that we're just trying to get people into heaven instead of trying to get heaven into people, uh, regardless of all that, they thought this was a good idea. It probably was a pretty successful business plan, right? Can you imagine? You just pay this, and you're in forever. Sign me up. How much are you willing to pay? (laughs) Well, a guy named Martin Luther comes along in the early 1500s. He's part of the Catholic Church, and he says, this is not right. This isn't what the Bible teaches. You can't do anything to earn your salvation. Not only can you not pay for it, you can't do any good works or work at all to get it. It's a free gift of God's grace that's only received through faith. It's by grace through faith alone that were saved. And so Martin Luther kicks off this Protestant Reformation, and that's why we're here today. We're a Protestant church. Salvation is by God's grace and gift alone, 
and you receive it by believing that it's true and that the work of Jesus is all you need in your life. We owe Martin Luther a lot of thanks. Now what happened after that, which is not Martin Luther's fault at all, but some people came after Martin Luther, and they said, you know who else is like that Catholic church? You know who else thinks that you get saved by working for it? Those Israelite people. They're like the Catholic church. They think you get saved by working for it. And that has been read into the Bible ever since. And it hasn't helped with accurate Bible interpretation. It surely hasn't helped with relationships between Christians and Jewish people. And the problem with that line of thinking is that Israelites never thought that way. They didn't think that the law of God was a means to salvation. It's really easy to find that out. They were saved from Exodus, during the Exodus, before they even had the law. Their salvation happened before the Torah was even given. How could they have kept it so that they got saved? Answer, that's not what the Torah was about. And so I know what you're wondering. Well, if that's not what it's about, then what is the purpose of it? When I was growing up, I had some restrictions, prohibitions on my life. You might call it a law. I had a certain time I had to be home. There was certain furniture I was not allowed to sit on. (laughs) Parents, you know, you have prohibitions in your home. You have laws in your home. When I got older, I got into high school, I found out there's another type of law. Because I joined the basketball team, and my basketball coach told us, hey, you are going to wear a nice shirt, a tie, nice pants, and dress shoes on game day. Whenever you have a game, you're going to dress up. And you're going to wear it to school. And you're going to wear it to the school you're playing at until you change out of your dress clothes into your jersey, your basketball uniform. Now that is not a prohibition law. That is a law of representation. You represent this school. You represent this team. You will dress this way. That is what God's Torah is about. This is how you will represent me to the world, Israel. God had brought Israel out of Egypt, but through the Torah, he will get the Egypt out of Israel. Israel has been living as slaves for hundreds of years, but through the teaching of God, they will become sons. And as children of God, they will represent their father to the world by following his instruction. It's about representation. The Ten Commandments and the other 613 laws, they are not the way that Israel gets access to God. They're not the way they get accepted or a means to salvation. They're not works versus grace. God's grace rescued them. They're given the teaching to represent him to the world. Are you tracking with me so far? Now, part of the problem that we find in the New Testament <clears throat> that Paul is always wrestling with is that that covenant, those laws, they get fulfilled by the ultimate representation of Jesus. And so Paul is always getting really frustrated that people are trying to live in season three of the Bible, which we're looking at right now, when they're actually in season five of the Bible. You ever got stuck in a season that's like your favorite season of your favorite show? And you just keep watching it over and over again? Paul will smack you for that. Don't get stuck in season three. Season three has a purpose. It's moving the story along. 
It's pushing Israel into their destiny so that the Messiah can come through them. But don't get stuck in season three. Paul's going to yell at you for that. Paul's going to write to you for that. He's not going to be happy with you if you're stuck in the wrong part of the story. We have to recognize that. We're not in season three, but season three shows us how God's moving this thing along. You guys are being real quiet. You see how this works? Okay. <clears throat> One thing we have to keep in mind as well is that this is the Torah is given as representation of God in the ancient land of Canaan, in the ancient Near Eastern world. What that means is that when we read these 613 laws in the Bible, they're going to get real weird. They're going to get real weird. I picked some safe ones to show you today. They get weirder than this. Deuteronomy 22, verse 8 is an example. When you build a new house, make a parapet around your roof so that you may not bring the guilt of bloodshed on your house if someone falls off your roof. If these laws are about salvation, some of you are in trouble if you've had somebody fall off your roof. I've seen my dad fall off a roof. I'll tell you that. We're in trouble. We didn't build the house right. Exodus 23, 19 says, Bring the best of your first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God, and don't cook a young goat in its mother's milk. You know there's only one law in the Torah that's repeated three times? It's so important that it's repeated three times. It's not don't murder. It's not don't steal. It's this right here. Don't cook a goat in its mom's milk. You gotta, we got to be thinking, are you kidding me? Is that, that needs to be repeated three times? Well, in the 1850s, they were doing some archaeological ex excavation at an ancient city called Ugarit. And they found this library that had these records of the land surrounding Israel. And what they found out is that Israel's neighbors, when they would worship their gods, one of the rituals was that they would cook a baby goat in its own mother's milk and sacrifice it. And see, what God is saying is, you represent me. And so Israel, you are going to see your neighbors doing this. You're going to see them cooking goats in their milk and they're going to tell in their mother's milk and they're going to tell you that that is appeasing their god but you represent me so you don't do that you're showing the world my wisdom so you don't do what you see your neighbors doing you're representing me to the world now that doesn't necessarily mean that translates to how we represent the world living in America in 2021. You understand that? That's important that we sort out. These are laws that give us a picture of how ancient Israel lived and represented God in their world, in their context. Now you may be wondering, man, does that mean I'm going to have to learn the ancient meaning of all 613 laws? This is going to be a lot of work if I'm ever going to get anything out of this. The answer is no. We still don't understand all the meanings of all the laws. Some of you who think the Bible was dropped out of heaven on golden tablets are going to have a problem with that. That's not how we got the Bible, though. The Bible came through us through history and through the oral traditions and the written traditions of Israel. So we don't know all the meanings, still to this day, to what every law meant and represented to them. But what I want you to remember is that we're still talking about a story. You're not reading a story and then you just hit a law book. You're reading a story that contains some laws in it. And if you keep track of what's going on, you'll notice what the story is trying to tell you. Because God gives Israel ten things to do. They're pretty easy. Don't kill anybody. Don't steal things. 
just worship me, don't make idols. As we read through the story, guess what the first thing Israel does is? They make a golden cow, and they worship it. And we go on through the story, and God says, okay, we're going to make another agreement. Here's another list of things to do. Guess what? Next thing Israel does is go against the list God just gave them. God says, okay, we're going to make another agreement. Here's another list of laws. Israel breaks them again. Okay, here's another agreement. Another list of laws. Israel breaks them again until you get to 613. The Bible's trying to tell you something in story form. We have a problem here. Israel's supposed to be the solution. They can't keep the Torah to represent God to the world. It's not happening. They are unable to represent him to the nations. They can't keep his teachings. They can't follow it. We're in trouble. Israel lacks the capacity to do what they are supposed to do. We all lack the capacity to do it. What's going to happen in this story? Well, Jeremiah, the prophet, he sees this happening, and he gets a word from the Lord that a solution is coming. Something's going to happen. See, he realizes humans, they need something more than just an external source telling them what to do. That's not working. Humans need a new heart. They need to be recreated. Something is off in the core of who we are. We need a new heart. We need a new operating system. And so Jeremiah says this in chapter 31. He says, for this covenant, he's talking about a new covenant that's going to come that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. He says, I will put my law within them. You remember what that word for law is? Torah. I will put my Torah within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. And they will be my people. See, Jesus comes and he represents God perfectly. He does what no human could do. He represents the Father. He shows his image. But then the Spirit comes and writes the Torah on the hearts of everyone who believes. See, the law required you to do something to represent God, but it lacked the capacity to actually enable you to do it. It said if you do this, you'll represent God, but the Bible shows us we couldn't do it. And so the Spirit comes and gives us a new heart and says, I'm going to lead you and instruct you how to represent God, but also you're going to be empowered to actually accomplish it. See, when you represent God, you're actually doing what you are created for. When you represent God, you are full. You're full of life. You're full of purpose because that's what you were made for. The Bible says you were made as an image of God. When you represent him, you're actually stepping into what you were meant to be. I think everybody probably in this room knows this. If you've ever given an extravagant gift to someone who did not deserve it, maybe a poor person or a a little child that they didn't do anything to earn it, you just gave extravagantly. And you know that you feel full when you do that. I feel so full of joy, so full of life. Because I've given something to someone else, right? The Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. I just use that as an example because that is an aspect of representing God. Because he's the ultimate giver. He's the ultimate generous one who gave to a people who didn't deserve it at all. When we image that, we feel full. There's countless ways we represent God. The point is we feel full. We feel our purpose is actually being fulfilled when we represent Him. You represent Him well by doing whatever He tells you to do. By following His Torah that's on your heart when you believe in Him. His teaching, His instruction. You represent Him when you do whatever He tells you to do. Look at your neighbor and say, do whatever He tells you to do. All right, 
Well, that was a little weak. I'm got to give the win to first service on that one, but we'll try again later on. <laughs> now, do whatever he tells you to do. Now, do can be a bad word in church. I've heard people say it's a do-do sermon if they tell you to do too much. But here's the deal. we got to remember, we can't do anything to be saved. You can't do anything for salvation. Jesus did everything for you. Are you following me? Jesus did everything. But at the same time, Jesus didn't do everything so that you can do nothing. Are you following me? Because you can't do anything for salvation, but I'm called to represent God to the world. And so when it comes to representing Him, bringing heaven to earth, expanding his kingdom, being his image. I'm not talking about being saved. I'm talking about stepping into being an image bearer. I need to do whatever he tells me to do. Not whatever culture's telling me to do. Not whatever the world thinks is right. Not whatever I just read about. I need to do whatever he tells me to do. Then I'll feel full. Then I'll be filled up. Some of you out there are feeling really empty. You're low. You're low on energy. You're low on peace. You're low on hope because you're spending all your time trying to figure out what everybody else wants you to do or whatever, or what you think everybody else needs you to do. We've got to get refocused on, God, what do you want me to do? God, what do you want me to do? And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, you're making that sound easy. If I knew what God wanted me to do, I would do it. Hello. You're out there going, I've been praying. Should I take this new job? I've been praying. Should I switch schools? I've been praying. Should I leave Vineyard East? The answer is no. (laughs) I've been praying. Should I put my money in the market? Should I take it out of the market? I've been praying. What do I do with my kids? Should I let them live? I've been praying. I've been praying, I've been praying. If I knew what God wanted me to do, I would do it. See, but what the laws teach us in the Bible, all those 613 laws, they show us that it's not about the times that you don't know what to do. It's about the times you didn't do what you knew to do. There's... Stuff you don't know. But there's a lot of stuff you do. Let me give you an example. Every person in this room that's older than five years old knows how to be in better shape than you are right now. I walked up a small hill yesterday. (laughs) And I got winded. I don't need to Google what to do. I know That ding-dongs and little Debbies are from the devil. (laughs) Hello. I know I can't eat a half a gallon of chocolate raisins every day. I know not to do that. I know I need to run. I need to get my heart rate up. I know what to do. It's that I didn't do what I knew to do. If you've been in church longer than five minutes, you know if I'm feeling discouraged, I should probably go to the Word and find some encouragement. You know that if you're going through a hard time, You may have to really hunker down and pray and pray and maybe fast and worship. You know what to do. Come on. Is anybody going to be honest with me out there? You know what you need to do. You've gotten yourself in a lot of bad situations in your life, not because you didn't know. Your parents tried to tell you. Your pastor tried to tell you. Your Bible tried to tell you. You knew. You just didn't do what you knew. Hello. When are we going to start doing what we already know to do? It's not about the times that you don't know what to do. It's about the times that you just didn't do what you already knew to do. Jesus makes it really easy for us because he takes all those 613 laws throughout the Bible 
And he's so smart, he condenses it into one. You want to represent God? Do this. One thing. Mark 12, verse 29. Jesus says, this is the most important one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. One command, two parts to it. Love God with everything you've got. Love your neighbor as yourself. You do that, you'll represent God to the world. Now here's what I've been learning about this verse this week. I'm going to pick on myself on this point because I picked on you guys a little bit on the last one. All right? I read this, and I thought, you know, I feel like I do pretty good at loving God. I think I do a pretty good job. I'm at church a lot. I would be here even if I didn't have to be here. I like being here. I love worship. I, read, I like reading my Bible. I pray. I think I do a pretty good job at loving God. But see, if you ask Maddie, my wife, she might tell you, that I don't always do that great a job at loving people. People can irritate me. (laughs) They can frustrate me. Sometimes I don't even want to be around people at all. I'll go sit with my dog. I love my dog. Amen. (laughs) See, but what this verse is trying to say is, if you think you're doing a good job of loving God, but you don't love people, You actually aren't loving God. Because you love God by loving people. Some of you think you're off the hook, but I'm not done yet. Because some of you think, well, I do a great job at loving people. I'm always helping people. I give to the poor all the time. I'm always helping my neighbor out with whatever project they need. I do such a good job at loving people. It doesn't matter if I show up to church three times a year. It doesn't matter if I give to church, I give to the poor people. I don't need to support the kingdom of God. It's real quiet. Must be a majority of people lover out, people lovers out there. See, because this verse is telling you, well, if you think you're doing a good job of loving people, you're actually not loving them as well as you think you are if you're not loving God. There's one command, two parts. You have to love God by loving people, and you love people well by loving God. I love God by loving people, and I love people well by loving God. It's both. You can't do that on your own. It takes the Spirit of God in you to actually fulfill that. But see, when you keep that commandment, the great commandment, love God, love people, you're actually representing God to the world. You follow that, you're representing Him. You're doing what you were born for. You're doing what you were made for. When you love God by loving people, and you love people well by loving God. Israel has, in my opinion, one big advantage to us when it comes to understanding how we represent God. And that is... If you read through those laws, you'll see what the teaching, the Torah of God, impacts in their world. It doesn't just impact the way they worship. It doesn't just impact the way they pray for people. The teaching of God impacts what they eat. It impacts how they build their home. Is it going to be safe for visitors? It impacts how they treat foreigners strangers. It impacts how they interact with their employees, how they run their business or their farms back then. See, it impacts every area of their life, but our problem living in modern day America is that we think there's this big hard line between secular and sacred, between natural and supernatural. Some of you know If you come to me and you start talking about dying and going to heaven, you start talking about trying to transcend into the spiritual realm, have more spiritual 
things, I might start twitching a little bit. Because I've spent the last several years trying to understand how to erase that line between secular and sacred that doesn't exist in this Bible. And it's really difficult to do because we're indoctrinated and we've grown up with this idea that there's the natural world, physical, and there's the supernatural world, and they're separated. And there's the secular world where I work and my job, and there's the sacred world where I come to church and worship. And we've got to figure out how to get rid of that line because it's not a real line. It's something we've built. In Acts chapter 19, 11 through 12, it says this, God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that he had touched his, that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them. And evil spirits came out of them. Now we, have to, we haven't done a good job of asking the question, what are those handkerchiefs and what are the aprons? Well, Paul was a tent maker. And the Greek word for handkerchief actually means sweat rag. And so it's not just that God's doing something powerful when Paul is up there preaching the word or writing letters or praying for people. The same spirit is moving through him when he's building a tent and his sweat rag is taken and it's move and it's brought and the power of God is moving and healing through the labor of Paul and we've got to start to realize if we're going to represent God well that the same spirit when you believe in Jesus that empowers the worship team to worship or empowers the prayer team to pray for someone and get them healed, that same spirit empowers you when you're turning a wrench, when you're teaching your class, when you're cutting hair. There's no line there that this is my secular work. When you've put your trust in Jesus, you're empowered by the Spirit of God, you're doing ministry. You're not doing ministry when you're at church. You're doing ministry when you're out building something. When you're remodeling the bathroom. When you're in your office. When you're staying at home with your kids. You're doing ministry and it's not second class ministry. It's the same spirit in it. The only reason you're thinking that it's second class is because you've got a line drawn between secular and sacred and natural and supernatural. God doesn't have supernatural. It's all just natural to him. He's just in it all. Heaven and earth are meant to overlap. They're not separate. They're not supposed to be separate. Your work is sanctified when you trust in Jesus. Everything you touch is sanctified. See, in the Old Testament, sin contaminates everything. Disease contaminates everything. If you get touched by a leper, you're out. Get out of the city. You're contaminated. In the New Covenant, righteousness and cleanness contaminate everything. Jesus, the clean one, touches the, lepers, the leper, and the leprosy goes. You see the difference? Old Covenant... I'm touched by the unclean, I become unclean. New covenant, the clean touches the unclean, it becomes clean. When you are clean, whatever you touch becomes clean. Whatever it is you're doing becomes clean, sanctified. We've got to get this so that we represent God to our world. Too many people think, that ministry is just whatever you do at church. That ministry is just preaching. That ministry is just leading worship. That ministry is just praying. Whatever it is, the same, whatever it is you're doing, the same spirit empowers you to do it. Whether a microphone is your tool, or a hammer and nail is your tool, or your computer is your tool, the spirit of God empowers it, and you represent him in what you do.
I thank God for Tylenol just as hard as I thank him when somebody prays for me and my headache goes away. Because it's the same spirit that's guided humanity to figure out how to make that as it is that divinely heals someone. We've got to learn to erase that line. It's not second class. If you're healed by a doctor, thank God in the same way you would if you're healed by someone laying hands on you. It's not a second class healing. God's guiding it because he does, he's not dividing supernatural and natural. He's just in it all. It's all natural to him. It's going to be hard work to do. I'm still working on it. It's difficult to erase that line. But if we're going to step into what God has for us, we're going to have to, to do it. We're going to have to figure it out so that we can represent him, not only here, but in whatever we do out in the world. Amen? All right, let's stand together. There may be someone in here who you just, uh, you have this dream in your mind or you have this place you would want to be or this thing you would want to be doing. I just ask, just bring that to your mind and bring that into your imagination right now. Because what I think God wants to say to you is, it's okay to chase that. It's okay to go after that dream. But don't miss what's happening right now. Your destiny is not somewhere out in the future. Your destiny is now. Your destiny isn't five years in the ro- down the road. Your destiny is now. And you can only do something in the present. You can't affect the future. You can't do anything in the future. You can't do anything in the past. You can only do something about where you're at right now. God has something for you where you're at right now. You may not love your job and you may want to do something else down the road, but remember, God is using you to represent Him where you're at. And when you represent God, you're full of life. You're full of purpose, because that's what you were meant to do. So God, I pray over every person here, help us this week to do what we already know to do, God. Help us just do the things that we already know that we should do. Lord, help us by your Spirit to fulfill the great command that we would love you and love people. And that we would love you by loving people and we love people well by loving you. We can only do that by your Spirit, so fill us anew today. Lord, help us to erase that line between natural and supernatural that doesn't exist for you and erase that line between secular and sacred that doesn't exist for you we're representing you wherever we're at God lead us and guide us by your word by your teaching by your instruction in our life Jesus we thank you that you made a way for us to actually have a new heart so that we could bear the image of God in the way we were meant to. If anyone is in this place today and you're saying, I've, I've felt at times in my life that fullness of representing God, but I've never fully stepped in to all that it could mean, I just invite you this morning to just accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He made a way for you to have a new heart so that you can represent God to your world. And the Bible says all you need to do is put your faith and trust in who He is and what He did and receive the Spirit of God into your life. So if you're here and you'd like to do that, then just grab one of our prayer team members after the service and they would love to pray with you and help you take your first step in that. And if you're online, Just put it in the chat, and we have moderators who would love to connect with you so that you can step into all that God has for you in your life. 
Jesus, we love you. We worship you. We honor you this morning. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's worship together.